Good morning and uh, welcome to everyone in, in the room and uh, everyone on, online to this policy panel. So uh, over the course uh, of these two days, uh, there's many interesting uh, original research contributions. But of course, the, the uh, hope is that this research and the underlying surveys also has a policy impact. So in this policy panel, we have the three co-sponsoring institutions for this uh, event, uh, ECB, uh, Bank of Canada, New York Fed. And of course, we also have someone who's, who's a, a leader in, in this line of research. And of course, who I'm sure shares the hope that policy is improved uh, by, by the use of the surveys. So, so the format is uh, each of us will give in some opening uh, remarks uh, for about uh, 10 minutes each. Uh, we, we'll have some uh, interchange and then uh, please get ready with your uh, uh, incisive and compelling questions. Um, so uh, with that uh, and fully acknowledging the incentive uh, problems of chairing the session and then giving some opening remarks, I, I will try to keep to my, to my uh, uh, time and uh, I ask the chair of the session to make sure I don't overrun. <laughs> so. Okay, so, so um, what I want to do, and maybe I have a unique role here, because I'm a consumer of the surveys. I think everyone else has been also involved in production. I'm a pure consumer. Um, in, in that sense, I have a slightly different role. So what I'm going to focus on is really, as a consumer, as a, someone involved in the policy process, uh, how I used the, the, all the different survey information. So uh, I'll just quickly run through a, a few points. One, of course, is the surveys uh, are really helpful in, in kind of thinking about uh, unobservables. So, of course, expectations are unobservable. And what's also interesting, I think, throughout the event is sometimes we care about true expectations. Sometimes we just care whatever you perceive, whether it's true or not, uh, your perception matters quite a bit. So uh, that's the first element uh, I want to uh, quickly look at. And maybe, uh, and here I'm going to use uh, our consumer expectation survey. And very quickly, and again, my strategy here is throughout, an, throughout a number of comments. I'm not going to try and resolve any, any research questions here. But just maybe uh, a couple of points here. It is one, um, I think the perception of past inflation uh, tracked actual inflation very closely in the run-up, which is impressive. But what's also interesting is how slowly perceptions of past inflation have declined. So they are declining, but it, it's a very asymmetric process. So, okay, that's one set of papers to be written. Why is that? Uh, a second point is the longer-term expectations uh, never were de-anchored all that much. So I, I think uh, that's very important. And I think an ongoing uh, unresolved issue is about one year ahead expectations. So are one year ahead expectations, basically uh, people understand uh, slow adjustment, that if inflation is high today, it's going to take time to get back to target. So in other words, the one year ahead is just a, a good, is people's perception of where are we going to be in a, an adjustment back to the anchor one year from now. Or is there some kind of backward element to this, where, where the kind of uh, observed inflation uh, is extrapolated into one year ahead expectations? So this makes a very big difference for lots of issues about what exactly do, do the one year ahead uh, expectations uh, cap capture. Uh, and then what's interesting about longer term expectations here is uh, they've been very more or less quite stable but there's a big confounding factor for the EU area. The jump in the data for the median from two to three was in March 22. March 22 was also the onset of the war. So in terms of, uh, I think it's, it's really important because of course the correlation between the war and the inflation dynamic is there, but it makes a big difference I think to the EU area about are these inflation expectations expressing generalized uncertainty, concern, or was it really that the war was seen to be a significant shock, not just in the near term, but to longer term uh, inflation uh, dynamics? Um, so let me, uh, uh, you know, th this is, I think, amplifies a bit of that point, but so let me skip and 
interest of time. So I, I know uh, in, in this event, uh, people have been also looking about how people think about the sources of inflation. And uh, what the left panel here says, which is interesting, and uh, I think we were reassured at various points in time, is essentially an understanding there was a lot of cost push inflation. So because the price of inputs were going up, that this was driving in inflation. What's also interesting though is the dynamic, and again, this is the value of having a stable survey where you can come back and ask the same questions and see that the answers change, which is over the, uh, 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 between 23, 24, as the nature of inflation has changed, we're, we're now in the second round. The, the kind of role of wage inflation has increased in prominence uh, and the, and the uh, role of, of uh, input inflation ha has declined. Uh, and so I think uh, we think, at least I think, uh, it says the median consumer is a fairly good macroeconomist, which is, uh, I think, reassuring. Uh, so let me uh, quickly also say that one of the other values of the survey, the consumer expectation survey, is we can see how people are responding to what they, their perceptions of high inflation. And I'm not going to go into the details here, but what's interesting here is uh, the expenditure response, but also the, the labor supply response, uh, and also the kind of wage bargaining response. So again, uh, uh, I'll let you look at the slides in, 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 uh, at your convenience, but I think that's also been an important element uh, of the survey. And then uh, very important, is timeliness. We have a lot of lagged data in the national accounts and other official sources. So if we find out that the survey-based data lines up in a reasonable way with official data, then the speedier access to the survey data is important. Uh, I think that there was a poster uh, last evening about the, the left side, which is I didn't really know whether this was going to work or not, but actually it's working out quite well that collecting uh, wage data from the CES, uh, not perfectly, but I think there's enough there in, in the mapping to compensation per, per uh, hour to, to really say, actually, this is an early indication for what's very important is, is the, the wage dynamic. And it also, it makes sense in terms of the, the cross-sectoral cross uh, nature and so on. There's also interesting uh, issues about rental data between uh, long-term tenants versus uh, recently moved and so on. So again, ex ante, this was not obvious to me this would work out, but it's ac actually working out in a reassuring way. Uh, also, the, I think with the savings rate, uh, it, it looks similar. It looks similar that the savings uh, you can infer from the consumer expectation survey could be an early indicator for the national account data, and savings is a big topic. I would say it's not perfect, so let's see how this develops over time. Uh, in particular, if you look at Q1 uh, at 24 there, the CES had a dip, a noticeable dip uh, in the savings rate, which in the national account data is maybe yet to be observed. Uh, so uh, let me now come back to the uh, issue about the term structure, because again, uh, we said throughout, we want a timely return of inflation to the target. So what does that mean? Uh, first of all, you have to have a, uh, an anchoring at the target, but the speed of return to the target matters also quite a bit. So how the one year ahead evolves is important. Because in other words, it, it's nice, it's a minimal condition that people say, I believe five years from now or three years from now, you'll be back to target. That's good. But we also want to see, is it the case people understand uh, that the inflation rate will be being driven down by policy, will come down relatively quickly. So in the survey of professional forecasters, um, there's always been a, a, a pretty steep negative slope. So there was an expectation that inflation would not instantaneously come back, but would come back fairly quickly. So let me emphasize again, uh, uh, for me, a, a lot of the discipline in looking at the surveys is about this term structure. Are we seeing, not, not unreasonably quick, so I mean there are lags, there are partial adjustments and so on, but is the speed of convergence something that, that we're okay with? Um, also, uh, again, this is not obvious why in the CES it should be, because I know a lot of 
papers here would be about persistence, about extrapolation from the actual data. But it, it is a very marked feature of the CES to have a, a fairly negative slope. Uh, and also, uh, and this, uh, over time, uh, they've been increasingly confident about the, the return in, in a timely manner to inflation. The left chart is just, there is a distribution. The right is about the median, but there is a distribution. But that distribution has also got smaller. Uh, also with firms, uh, again, you can see um, over, over the, the different rounds, and again, the, the expansion of our safe survey to include inflation block, to move it to quarterly, I think is super important. Uh, and I, I think, again, it's been reassuring to see this uh, uh, increasing confidence of our timely return to target. We also now, uh, it's, of course, monetary policy is not just about the, the baseline, it's about risk. Uh, and also tracking uh, what the firms are reporting about risk is also important. Uh, so uh, let me um, uh, briefly say, you know, I think there's enough in the data to say the expectations add something. So including expectations data in BVARs and, and the forecasting models helps, especially over, you know, uh, a longer term horizon. Um, but, but let me, let me because uh, I, I know it's now big flashing red, but let, let me make two, two last points about what's going on right now. So uh, here, on, this is the market, um, and it goes from September 23, our last hike, to now. And the left side is over the next five years, the spot five year, you know, over the next five years. And look, look at the change from, so, uh, a year ago, uh, the average inflation rate, according to, to this calculation, was expected to be two and a half. Now it's markedly below two. And on the right, it's the five year, five year. Look, look, let's look beyond five years to five years in, in five years' time. Um, and uh, the way I interpret this is in expectation, it's around two, but the risk of being above two has really come down. And I think that's quite important. Uh, other ways to do it with the option pricing, and you see all of these measures where, where the balance of risk was to the upside over different horizons. These are now increasingly to the downside uh, um, from, from the options data. So, so that is important. And also, of course, in the near term, when we try to think about what's happening in the coming months, uh, we look, you know, we have our own macro forecasts. We have this machine learning model the regression forest mean, which gives you quite a wide outcome. And of course, then we have the inflation fixings. And of course, you can see here uh, reasons why we should be data dependent, g given the fairly wide range here. So let me stop there. And uh, Yuri, you're next. Thank you very much for including me in this uh, wonderful panel. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, we had a little bit of a uh, division of labor, and my task was to talk uh, briefly about firms' inflation expectations, what we have learned about their properties, and uh, what these expectations may mean for policy. And let me start my uh, brief remarks with this quote from uh, Ben Bernanke many years ago when he was talking about inflation and inflation expectations. And he had a long speech about saying that inflation expectations are very important to understand area dynamics. They're also important for policy, for management of expectations, for controlling inflation. And one of the remarks he made in his uh, speech was that we actually know very little about firms' inflation expectations. And it's true, as of 2007, we didn't have many surveys of firms' inflation expectations. Um, and this is striking because when you think about almost any standard macroeconomic model used for policy, we have a Phillips curve of some kind, and we have to have firms inflation expectations to really work with this kind of object. And we didn't have anything like this in the US, um, in, the, in the Euro area, we had this for a few countries, but generally this was a very scarce commodity, this firms inflation expectations. Now in recent years, we made a lot of progress and we learned a lot about their properties. And uh, when I focus on the US, where we had a slightly longer time series for expectations, we can see some very interesting developments. Um, I'm sure everybody in this audience knows this uh, time series of inflation in the US. There was a big increase in inflation in 2000, uh, 2022. 
Um, and one question is how inflation expectations contributed to this and if there is any special role for firms or households inflation expectations in propagating this dynamic. Let me start with sort of the good news. Um, that's going to be professional forecasters in the US. And uh, consistent with what Philip showed earlier, they have relatively anchored inflation expectations, right? So even at the heat of the crisis, they didn't really um, saw that two-digit inflation is possible. We, we also see that they predict very fast convergence uh, to the inflation target. And now we see they predict uh, inflation is going to decline to the target relatively soon. So this is good news. Now, maybe not so good news is when you look at households, and again, this is consistent with what Philip uh, showed for the ECB, um, the inflation expectations of households don't seem to be particularly anchored. Right? So you kind of start with a high level, then it roughly tracks inflation, and even now, inflation expectations are very much elevated. And to be clear, this is Michigan uh, sort of consumers. Some other surveys uh, have uh, slightly different results, but the general idea here is that inflation expectations of households remain quite elevated. Now, the key question is then where are firms are going to be in this spectrum? Do they look like professional forecasters or do they look like households? Unfortunately, we have a new survey, which Oli Corbion and I started in 2018, and now it's run by the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. And uh, this is a survey of CEOs uh, of American firms. And what you see here is that this blue line is always somewhere between households and professional forecasters. So sometimes, sometimes CEOs look like professional forecasters, sometimes they look like households. But during this inflation search, they looked a lot more like households. There is a massive increase in inflation expectations. And even now, they are well above professional forecasters, roughly one percentage point above. So when we think about possible risks for monetary policy, when you look at this figure, you realize that professional forecasters are pretty much convinced that inflation is going to come back to, to the inflation target very soon. Households and firms are much less uh, you know, sure about that. And another way to see this is to look at the degree of disagreement you have in these various surveys. Again, the, the green line is professional forecasters. They tend to basically always agree that inflation is going to be 2% within a year. It's kind of a boring uh, set of agents. Um, you look at households, there is a lot of disagreement, and maybe this is not surprising given how much heterogeneity we have at the household level. But what is striking about households is that the disagreement increased dramatically and it stays very, very elevated. Now, we know this is not necessarily uncertainty, but to the extent we know that this disagreement is driven by beliefs in the right tail of inflation expectations, this is a troubling signal telling us that inflation expectations are still very, very fluid. They can go in a high direction very quickly. There is not much anchoring there. Again, when you look at firms, somewhere in between, they are not as, um, uh, you know, crazy maybe as, as households, but they are definitely uh, observe, we, we see a lot more disagreement for, uh, for firms than for professional forecasters. So to underscore uh, the main messages here, A, uh, firms are not like households or professional forecasters. That's why we need to have a separate survey for them. And B, we see some dynamics in the data in recent years, which I think is suggesting to us that we should be careful in thinking about whether we really stopped inflation or if inflation, is, inflation risk is still you know, a significant concern. Now, we can learn also a lot, not just from the time series variation, but also from the cross-sectional variation. And here I want to switch to the uh, survey Philip mentioned earlier, uh, SAFE, uh, Survey on Access uh, to Finance of Enterprises. Uh, it is a well-established survey, it has been running uh, for many years. And after a pilot stage in uh, 2023, last year, uh, we now have a, an established uh, firm survey in the Euro area, which is very informative about what managers are thinking about inflation in the Euro area and also potentially in their uh, local economies. The, the wordings of the questions are very simple. You basically elicit their point predictions for one year ahead forecast, for three year ahead forecast, and uh, for five year ahead forecast to get the sense of the term structure, which may be very important and understanding how quickly inflation is going to uh, come back to the target. And you know, one thing I want to emphasize here is not necessarily the point predictions for the euro area, but the geographical variation in inflation expectations across countries. 
we have many, many countries in the survey. This is the strengths, a unique strength of this uh, survey where inflation expectations are measured consistently across different locations and so we can compare apples to apples. And what you should see in this figure is that what firms are thinking about euro area inflation, that's the vertical axis, is going to be colored by the inflation experiences they have in their national economies. For example, you look at Slovakia, Austria, you know, observations to the right. This is the countries that were particularly exposed to um, energy price hikes. You know, when Russia invades Ukraine, energy uh, prices go through the roof, and these countries experience the highest rates of inflation in the euro area. But they also continue to believe that the whole euro area is going to have high inflation expectations. Now, this is short-term inflation expectations, and there are some pros and cons of using short-term inflation expectations for policy analysis. But even when you look at longer-term inflation expectations, you still see that this short-term, presumably, inflation experiences color their perceptions of where inflation is going to be in the euro area. So again, a much bigger you know, economy than, say, Austrian economy or Slovakian economy. Now, another way to see this is to look how uh, managers in this uh, survey think about the inflation rates in their own countries versus the euro area. And again, this is a, a unique strength of the survey. And what you see here again, this relationship that, you know, what I think is going to happen in my local conditions, in my national economy, is going to predict the behavior of inflation in the whole euro area. So think about this as we have a bunch of islands in the euro area, they observe their local conditions and then they extrapolate from their local conditions to the whole euro area. Now, the reason why it's important is because if you want to manage inflation expectations in these conditions, if you have different members of the union moving at different speeds, having different inflation expectations, it's very difficult to communicate with this public because they have different ideas about where inflation is going to be and how quickly inflation is, is going to converge to the target. Now, I like the term structure too. Uh, this is a figure from um, my paper with uh, uh, many uh, colleagues at the ECB. Uh, and what you should see here is uh, consistent with what Philippe showed earlier, that there is a lot of convergence in terms of uh, inflation expectations at longer horizons. We have a lot of heterogeneity in terms of experienced inflation. One year ahead, there is a little bit more convergence. Three years ahead, there is more convergence. Five years ahead, there is even more convergence. So this is good news. People think of the sense of, you know, part of the union where everybody is going to have the same um, rate of inflation. Now, to recap, firms' expectations are potentially very, very important for understanding uh, price setting at the micro level and also inflation dynamics at the aggregate level. But this is a, also a very, very understudied subject. So ideally, we would like to see more research here. Um, we see that a firm's expectations are not particularly anchored, um, but there is a spectrum of anchoredness uh, you see in the economy. Professional forecasters more anchored than firms, but firms are more anchored than households potentially. And finally, I think we see lots of uh, challenges and opportunities when you work in the, in the monetary union where uh, we have heterogeneity in terms of inflation expectations. It's much harder to kind of shape everything when you have this heterogeneity. But at the same time, this emphasizes the critical role of policy communication when you can tailor your messages to specific audiences and hopefully have a better control over their inflation expectations. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, and that next up, uh, for, uh, from the Bank of Canada, Kim. Well, thank you very much for um, this opportunity to speak on this distinguished panel. So uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the Bank of Canada, but I received a lot of input from uh, colleagues who are much more expert than me, especially because I'm at the East Tower, which is uh, mostly financial and uh, infrastructure, whereas most of this conference is about M or monetary policy. So everything I say was my views and my views only, including the hallucinations I may have. Uh, so uh, yesterday, uh, the vice president uh, discussed about the uh, surveys, and so I thought of going back in history books, and this is very nice uh, papers and proceedings about the use of surveys for policy research by Thomas Gister. Uh, he was the director of um, survey research at the University of Michigan, and he outlined five uh, reasons why we 
do surveys and how we use it for policy research. So I won't say it, but you can read it for yourself. It's an excellent uh, article, and that's how it frames the discussions I'll have. So at the Bank of Canada, we have three types of surveys that we run, uh, consumer, business and firms, financial institutions, and market participants. So uh, very similar to the Eurozone and other cent uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York and other central banks, we have the survey of consumer expectations, these business outlook surveys, business leads with pulse, senior loan officer survey. Uh, then we also uh, um, have the method of payment survey and the merchant acceptance surveys that help us understand about the evolution of cash and payments. And then very recently we've added the market participants survey. So I thought I'd give a shout out to them by showing the uh, utility of the market participants survey. So this was uh, an assessment over uh, in tw end of 2022 about what inflation would be for market participants. These are financial institutions of what inflation would be in 2023. And so you can see the probability distribution. Uh, you can see most of it's centered uh, around two to three or three to four percent. So that's what was uh, the expectations and what's the realization. Well, by December 2023, it's about 3.4 percent. So just at that boundary between those two uh, buckets. Uh, just to follow up on uh, Philip and uh, Yuri's discussion about inflation expectations, uh, here's a graph of what uh, we see from the consumers and uh, firms and professional forecasters. So uh, when in discussions with Monica, she uh, wrote a very nice paper. Uh, so what she did was uh, she looked at these expectations and she used a factor augmented vector auto regression. So that's, uh, if that's the red, um, black line. And then what she did was took firm expectations from the business outlook survey and included in there. So that's the blue line. And then if we could compare that to the, uh, our monetary policy projection model, TOTEM or the total terms of trade equilibrium model, that's the red line. You can see there are some differences between these impulse responses in response to a 25 basis point increase in the policy rate. So what do we see? Uh, w once you account for uh, when uh, Monica and her co-author they add uh, for firm expectations in there. You can see that the impulse response is much stronger and persistent. So th this uh, goes back to the discussion that uh, Yuri had about how do we think about when we incorporate firm expectations and how do we compare it to the uh, projection models that we have. So that's some food for thought for us all. Uh, so I work in the currency department and so we do a lot of work around consumer assessments of is there a role for the future of cash? And so we ask questions about uh, do you plan to use ca uh, do you plan to stop using cash anytime soon? So this question's for uh, in the last in the next five years. So we've done these surveys from 2018, 21, and 23. So you can see that the consumers have been pretty much, uh, you know, 80 percent above 80 percent have said uh, they have no plans to abandon cash. In 2021, uh, when it was during the pandemic, it's fallen a bit, about 78 percent, and then by 2023, it's rebounded again. And if we look at merchants' point of view, very similar uh, expect, you know, no, they have really 80 percent have no plans to uh, stop using cash, and you actually see this this uh, counterintuitive that during the pandemic, the depths of the pandemic, that this rises. And part of that is, well, uh, thinking, using these surveys, we find that many of these merchants, when they are uh, facing some of their mobility restrictions, they want to make sales. So they don't want to turn around, turn, uh, not accept cash and turn away customers. So these are stated preferences once again. So we always try to validate stated preferences with what we call revealed preferences. So we ask them, well, how much cash do you actually have in, um, on your person or in your store? So you can see for 
the average consumer, uh, 2000, around 2018, they have about $100, roughly. And then during the pandemic, it rose to about 127, and then recently it's about 140. So that's the um, red line. Then you see what happens with merchants. Right? Merchants are holding about $600 in these small, medium-sized businesses. They're holding about $600 in float during that time. Then during the pandemic, yes, they're accepting cash, but maybe there's not as much cash sales, so they hold a smaller float. And by the time the pandemic ends, uh, it returns. So uh, one of the division of labor that I was asked to discuss is about when we are doing these surveys, what's happening in the background. And so I thought I would remind, I know this is, uh, we usually don't discuss at these, <laughs> these conferences, but what we call the total survey error approach about what type of errors do we see in the data that, uh, that we can undertake. And so this is a schematic that's uh, in the paper by Groves and Lyberg about what kind of errors you can face, right? There could be, if we look at the measurement side, there's, there could be measurement error. When you process data, there could be processing error. But I think the, the big one for uh, many of us will be on the right-hand side is the representation error, which is you want to uh, survey this target population. So this is what we call coverage error. And so we know in Canada, when we do some surveys, uh, Canada is a very large country, and we have some very remote areas. So in, in the north, Northwest Territories, Nunavut and Yukon, it's very expensive to reach this population. So for some of our surveys, we are not able to include them. So we have to know that we have this coverage error. Knowing that we have this coverage error, we can't make statements about uh, what happens in, in these areas. So the second source of error uh, below that is what we call sampling error. So sampling error is when we go out and we do this sampling frame. We need to get uh, you know, stratified random samples. For some of us, we are not always using a probabilistic survey frame. So we may have this non-probability sample, which leads to not getting uh, this representative sample so we call sampling frame uh, error. Then finally, the what I call, or what we call the, once you have these uh, sampling error after that is the non-response error. So that could be in terms of people not, wa not answering the survey, not undertaking it, or even doing what we call item non-response, not answering certain questions. So we have to face this. So that's why, uh, it's a cautionary tale, handle with care. And then uh, we know that now there's been this rise of uh, lar large language models. And so for fun, I always uh, do some uh, inv exploratory investigations using uh, various uh, large language models. So this is a picture of these transformers, right? The, anyone who's a watches this series, you can see there's Optimus Prime and Megatron, two countervailing forces, right? We want to leverage uh, Optimus Prime to fight against the, uh, the evil of Megatron. So when we do these type of surveys, we can see increasingly now, uh, especially younger uh, colleagues who are more technologically adept, they are using this uh, generative AI. So we should be very careful what, where we're getting from it. So handle with care. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And then the, the, the final speaker in this first round is, is Wilbert. So please. Uh, thank you very much for including me. Um, so in, at the New York Fed, we also have a number of different surveys, uh, including recent work we've done on business leaders in their price setting behavior. Uh, what I will talk about here uh, are really some insights from our consumer survey, uh, survey of consumer expectations. And um, before I start, uh, these are my opinions and not those of the Federal Reserve and Federal Reserve System. 
So what I'll start is uh, talking a little bit about inflation expectations. Uh, so these are kind of the measures we typically look at, to try to understand what's happening. Uh, and then talk a little bit about labor market expectations and um, household finance expectations. And finally, just some you know, kind of starting thoughts about you know, what's next in the collection of expectations data, what are the, com the challenges and, the, and uh, you know, new areas to think about. Um, so now this is becoming a very familiar chart uh, of inflation expectations and realized inflation. Um, so what we focus on in the New York Fed is, uh, you know, traditionally had a one-year and three-year horizon uh, about inflation expectations. And then in 2002, we started, uh, 22, we started um, adding a five-year uh, horizon. And um, what, we, what we see is uh, very similar to uh, what we've seen in other countries, is you see a big surge in one-year inflation expectations. They have started to come down, and we're now back to 2018 levels. Uh, so we're basically there uh, with one year. Um, I think our period might is up to last month, so it's maybe a little bit more recent than Yuri's uh, chart that he just showed. The three year also went up actually quite a, quite a bit in our survey. It also has come down. And then the purple line is the five year ahead. Um, and you see that that's been pretty stable throughout this period. So in terms of long term expectations, we see this as, you know, those expectations remained anchored throughout this period. Um, when you look at disagreement, and that's uh, similar to what Yuri showed, is there we see a huge surge in this disagreement uh, across you know, um, people's expectations, and that's still very high, very, very elevated level. Uncertainty, similar. We also see a big uh, increase, and that's still coming down. And you look at the latest numbers, it looks like it's, it's slowing down. So uh, you know, a bit more than uh, disagreement, it uh, looks like it's moderating, but still elevated. Um, and when you look at the tails of the distribution, because disagreement is really just capturing what's going on in the tails, and same thing with uncertainty. Um, so whether you look at the average probability that people assign to tail events, or we just look at the proportion of respondents that whose point forecasts are in the tails, you see the same pattern, which is on the left-hand side, you see an increase in deflation expectations. And actually, it went up from like 10% to 25% uh, for the three year. And it's still much higher than it used to be. So deflation expectations um, you know, remain elevated. And it's really uh, something that's not just happening here. Uh, when you look at the Bank of Canada survey, you see exactly the same thing. Uh, when you look at the Bank of England survey, you also see a big increase in deflation expectations in the ECB a little bit less, you see some in the th on the three-year horizon, but not as strong as what we're seeing in, uh, um, in, the, in the US. Um, and on the right-hand side, we look at the right tail, so forecast above 4%, uh, or you know, probability assigned to over 4%, doesn't matter which measure you use, there was a huge surge, and that has come down, and now we're approaching kind of pre-COVID uh, levels. So the right tail moved out, now it's come back in. The left tail is still you know, thicker than it was before. So this deflation expectations are pretty interesting. Um, so uh, we did some additional research. One, we did an experiment where we tried to understand, you know, does this mean that inflation expectations are getting unanchored? And when we focus on the five year, as, you, uh, as I showed you, it really remained stable through this period. Uh, when we did hypothetical shocks, we find the same result that, you know, these expectations are not very sensitive to inflation shocks. So that's kind of what you want to see in long-term inflation expectations. Now, coming back to the deflation expectation, the question is, okay, is this real or are people confused about, uh, you know, deflation or slowing inflation? Uh, so we asked follow-up questions uh, to really prod that, like, what they really mean, uh, or why they th think that uh, there might be deflation. So first of all, the confusion does not explain this. Uh, there's as much confusion 
uh, amongst people who expect inflation as well, you see amongst people who expect deflation. And when we asked about particular reasons why they expect deflation, you get answers that kind of tell a, a consistent story. There are people who really think that prices you know, revert back to the mean. And so, for example, when we uh, ask for, you know, we, go, we show them about 20 factors, and these are the top four factors that they mentioned for the reason why they expect, expect deflation. The first one was we, we expect improvement in the supply chain. So that would lower prices. So, for example, people might think about used car prices, which you know, went up hugely in, in the U.S. and have come down since. Um, also, Federal Reserve policies were very surprised. People really thought that we would you know, put the brakes maybe too much <laughs> and lead to deflation. And then this comes back to the talk uh, in the previous session, the last talk where uh, you, know, you find this correlation. You, know, you might say, well, people might expect deflation because they expect you know, a, a recession. But no, in fact, it's the opposite. So people expect a strong economy you know, are the ones who are expecting low inflation or deflation. That, so the same pattern comes up here, and it's consistent with the story about the supply chain problems, you know, supply issues getting resolved, so supply increasing, productivity, you know, output going, going up, and, uh, but at the same time, inflation coming down. Uh, so these are um, interesting findings, and it's, it's still persisting. Um, other expectations we look at are um, related to the labor market. So these are earnings growth expectations. This is earnings on the same job. And what you see there is, you know, at the beginning of pandemic, earnings expectations went down, but not for a very long time. And then they start going up. And then they went to levels much higher than pre-COVID. And we're still higher than pre-COVID. So people are still pretty optimistic about wage growth. And on the right-hand side, you see also wage uncertainty. That also went up a lot and remains much higher. Um, when you actually look at uh, layoff, expected risk of layoff, you also see this kind of a um, you know, huge improvement during, um, you know, after 2022. And now it's going to come back to uh, what it was before COVID. These charts here are the probability of finding a job if you were to lose your job in the next three months. So what is the probability of finding a job? And this is split by uh, household income. And what you see there during, you know, when at the start of the pandemic, these expectations kind of collapsed, uh, labor market froze up and then rebounded. And then, you know, it looked pretty good, but recently these expectations have started coming down again. So people are getting more pessimistic about finding a job if they were to lose their job. Even though the risk of, find, of losing a job is, is, you know, was much lower and now it's come back to pre-COVID level. So these are kind of things that are somewhat worrisome and really point to the slowing down in the labor market that we're seeing. Um, on the other hand, when you look at spending expectations, uh, spending growth expectations, um, and of course, we, we, for many months, we've been kept on being surprised by the good spending numbers. Now, in the survey, we've shown this, you know, for, for the, you know, this whole period that spending expectations surged uh, you know, during, the, during the pandemic, and they've started to come down, moderate a little bit, but they're still very high. And this is really kind of uh, you know, consistent with this very solid spending that we've seen uh, in, in the U.S. Um, so just a couple of thoughts, um, you know, issues that, that, that are challenging with running surveys. I mean, we've now, we're in the 11th year of doing this. Um, it's just like many other surveys out there, response rates are going down. It's harder, um, you know, to get, um, you know, people to respond to surveys. It, that happens, doesn't matter how you interview people on the phone, in person, uh, on the internet, it's across the board. All surveys have this, this challenge. Um, and this, with that comes the challenge of remaining representative. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of interesting experiments going on across different survey organizations in, in trying to make sure that, you know, samples remain representative using mixed mode uh, interviewing and so on. Uh, opportunities, uh, one, one thing that we, we now have panels uh, at different, you know, many different countries working at the same time over the same period. And uh, there's a lot of scope for doing a lot more in international comparisons. 
of these kind of microdata and try to understand what are the difference between countries. And I'm particularly thinking also comparing Europe, US, and Canada. Um, and then more methodological work. We, we, you know, we don't really know much about what's the optima optimal way to collect, let's say, density forecasts. Okay, there's some work on that, but you know, the more work can be done. And finally, and this is a you know, question that, that we've kind of avoided this whole time is, when you look at decisions, like whose expectations matter? So in a household context, uh, you know, we usually get the household head, but you know, when you get expectations of all the people in the household, that would be extremely interesting to see whose expectations matter more for which decisions. Uh, so we're still, I think, very much at the very beginning of collecting this kind of data and using it to better understand decision making. Uh, so still lots of opportunities for, for the future. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, just running across uh, all, all of these uh, opening contributions, uh, I think it's, it served one purpose is I, I think we've got more questions now than answers. So it's been a, uh, you know, <laughs> which, which is, I think, um, is an interesting distinction between a policy panel uh, where for policy making, you, you do have to think about limitations and what we don't know versus, of course, an individual piece of research you try to say, okay, I've learned something here. Uh, so, so, so I think that's interesting. But let me pick up on a few things uh, that, that came up. Uh, so, so in a very vivid way, you had a cautionary uh, warning there came about large language models, but maybe can you elaborate on the concerns you have? And then I'll ask the other panelists also to, to comment maybe on, on their own uh, either pitfalls or opportunities with, with uh, the large language models. Well, I always think about uh, these large language models. Well, I just go back to the, well, what you learned in the econometrics when Halbert White started thinking about these neural networks. So neural networks are this literally, this uh, nonlinear regressions, like very different layers or, and this feedback effects. So when we are doing things with these prompts, uh, we're asking uh, large language models, there could be these hallucinations. So I, I did this as an experiment. I looked at all of you, I asked Miles of all three of you, and there was always some error in it. Right. So uh, I think that, that's uh, one thing that we always have to be very careful about, to, uh, that these things are not exact, uh, preci uh, precise. So there's going to be error at some point. So when one goes to u start using this, we have to parse out this, this error that's resulting from this, this transformer model that we have. And then further to that, some of the work that we do is especially at Bank of Canada, we've been given very clear uh, direction that uh, we are using data that's privy to decision making. So how should we think about doing that and putting, you know, we, we shouldn't be putting this data onto this large language models. So then that entails, you have to build the infrastructure inside the, the Bank of Canada to keep it ring fenced. And so then when you go about doing this, uh, there, there will be challenges of you yourself having to build that model and then incorporating with all the other models you have. So this, um, I would say that, that, would, that would be what I, I think is the uh, top level concern for us. Very good, thank you. Uh, Wil Wilbert, Wilbert, do you have any thoughts? Um, well, we've not really done a lot of work with the, these large language models. I think more generally, uh, you know, uh, maybe I can say something about natural language pro processing and, and uh, machine learning methods. Um, you know, in, in trying getting a sentiment there, I think these models can be useful. Uh, what worries me a, a lot about, uh, you know, these approaches is stability. Um, you know, in times of big changes, whether Patterns in the past that you find in the data are really that informative. Um, so how you know how robust are these, and you know especially times when you you might want to need them and to get the you know quick quick you know kind of uh, signals from what's out going out on there. You know mm -hmm. it might be that at those moments those relationships break down and then it's actually gives you the wrong advice. So 
that's kind of a concern I have. So, so there's a, a noise to signal issue there, yeah. for sure. So Yuri? I'm very optimistic about the large language models for various reasons. Uh, one of them, it's true they may be interpreted as not robust, but you can take a different uh, view on this and say they are very flexible, <laughs> and so you can, you can fully <laughs> control <laughs> various elements of those models. Um, one application in the context of service where I think this is going to be particularly important is the opportunity to process huge amounts of unstructured text. You know, lots of comments in this conference were about what is the mental model of, you know, this type of agent or that type of agent. And if you have a large survey like CES, 19,000 people, there is no chance anybody, I mean, maybe you can instruct everybody in the ACB to read a few responses and score them, that would be very expensive. But the cost of doing this through a large language model is very, very small. And, um, and you can extract something useful from that. You know, it may be a sentiment, it may be if people think it's a supply shock, a demand shock, or, you know, in general, how they think about the world. So, so yeah, so I, I think um, uh, we're all in the early stages uh, on that. May, maybe uh, I mean, throughout the presentations, uh, we've seen uh, just the, the range of surveys now. So we have households, we have, we have firms. Um, then there's interesting, you, you mentioned this business, senior business leader survey, and you have a CEO survey. Mm -hmm. And let me say, I didn't mention it today, we have what's uh, quaintly called a corporate telephone survey, uh, um, <laughs> where it's basically very large corporation. But we, we do, uh, and what's interesting, and going back, uh, is, is converting conversations into numerical scores. So, so that, that's an interesting, and it's actually proven helpful uh, throughout. Uh, and you were mentioning just towards the end there about what's next and, and so on. Um, and you mentioned even geographically, uh, different parts of Bank of Canada, different places and so on. And of course, for business reasons, different surveys are being run by different units here at ECB as well. Uh, so there's some kind of meta aggregation issue here about how we aggregate uh, you know, a, a across different surveys. Uh, but maybe, Yuri, I mean, because you obviously have been involved in the development of, of consumer surveys and now the firm level surveys, uh, and you had some, some comparisons there. But do you have any kind of uh, sense of an overarching approach about, you know, if we're trying to have a, maintain an overall narrative, how the different surveys kind of, uh, what do we learn by kind of, uh, uh, so, for example, for us, one interesting issue is, is whether when firms see consumers expecting high inflation, does that change the behavior of firms? So, so does, that's a very natural interaction, but you tell me, um, do, you, do you have a sense uh, of how to integrate what you learn from the households and from the firms? It's a huge question. I will need more than three minutes to answer <laughs> it. <laughs> but I would say this, you know, one conclusion I have from household surveys is that people are not economists and economists are not, you know, regular people. They look very different. <laughs> uh, but, you know, these interactions between households and firms are, are, are very interesting and very important. Um, <clears throat> you know, one reason why firms could raise prices is because uh, customers can ac accept those price increases. And in a high inflation environment, what I see from surveys is that firms say, well, we can have a higher cost because we don't have to justify these increases to consumers. They expect this to happen. And in our models, there is the sense of fairness or so interactions between households and firms is not very well established. I think we would, we would need to study this uh, more. And this would be a reason why we need to have departments studying firms' expectations and consumers' expectations talk to each other more often. Very good. Uh, Kim, I mean, at the Bank of Canada, um, how do you integrate across the different surveys? Well, I always think that that's, uh, we have people who are practitioners and are running the surveys to give policy advice. But I think that's where it's important that researchers get involved in using that data to put structure to it. So a very good example of consumer and firm expectations is uh, some of the work Alexei Kritsov has done on cheapflation. Right. So consumers have this view about what uh, price uh, inflation is. These grocery stores have this view about 
inflation, but then you put it together, and then you see with some modeling work, you know, your standard uh, or whatever type of uh, these DSG models of how you can rationalize what we call cheap inflation. So poor households may uh, start substituting towards lower uh, lower price uh, stores, but because the proportion of the prices are much higher, they face a higher rate of inflation. Right. So that, that could be the experience part. So. Very good. Uh, Wilbert? Yeah, I, I think they really complement each other very well. So for example, when you look at the labor market to you know measure plans that firms have in terms of uh, hiring and then looking at what workers are expecting, uh, also about wage pressures and so on and, and the sources of that, I, I think they really complement each other. I would say like, one thing that you really learn from doing surveys for firms and individuals is the value of qualitative research and doing cognitive interviews at the very beginning to really try to understand how to ask the question right. And, um, and I find those so you know, useful. I mean, the work we've been doing, Giorgio mentioned it yesterday, uh, also with Rafael, we talked to business leaders before we actually did the survey. We had a, you know, but 10 or 20 business leaders that we spoke to about price setting behavior and exactly these issues like how much do they take into account? Okay, if I increase my prices, you know, is there demand there? Can we afford to do it? And in other firms, they said, no, there's huge, you know, competitors are not moving, so we can't move. To try to understand that heterogeneity, I think is very, very important, uh, you know. So I think the lessons from all these surveys is the importance of heterogeneity and, and how do you ask, how do you, you know, extract it from the data? I mean, uh, for me, just, you know, um, it's been an exercise in humility because there's so many surprising results. And one of the results you were emphasizing there is the deflation result um, about the rise in deflation expectations. But when I was listening to you, I was just saying, okay, let me try and... Uh, and of course, we as economists have a definition of deflation. Um, but but there's a you know, uh, if I was trying to think about it, and you already mentioned the reversion in commodity prices, more generally, is deflation a decline in the price of consumption compared to earnings? So in various people out there, oh, the number of hours to buy you know a, you know a, a restaurant meal is co coming down and so on. So is this deflation in the sense of uh, if you do it in units of work effort, th that kind of thing. Um, right. So it's interesting, again, and probably you need the qualitative research to, to kind of uh, dig into that. Okay, I'm going to now uh, see, uh, I will keep an eye on the tablet for online questions, uh, but, but uh, w first of all, in the room, but w when, when you ask a question, just again, uh, it's probably helpful for everyone if you uh, s say who you are and your affiliation. So pa Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick Sabourin from the Bank of Canada. Um, just two comments on, on, on what has been discussed about uh, the firms and consumer. In fact, at the bank, we integrate the surveys together and we have a theme that force itself to say what's common between what the firms has to say and what the con consumers has to say. And when there are differences, we need to understand why. Um, and then you see most, most of the time a lot of similarities, for instance, firms which are selling to a sector which are sensitive or no, they sell discretionary good, they would see their demand declining more, and then it would be aligned, let's say, with consumers, which are reporting, giving the context of high interest rates, high inflation, that their demand would be weaker, and so on. So, so what we force ourselves to, to connect the two things. In terms of deflation, um, like Wilbert, we did the same work at the Bank of Canada, but in addition to that, what we try to do is that we try to uh, compare our, our, our surveys results and say, okay, what the heck are they thinking about when they think about deflation? But you, we also use the micro data of CPI because it's available in Canada. And so, as you may know, a lot of consumers will focus on very specific things they would purchase. But when you look at the micro data, you saw a lot of these supply chain issues, uh, pushing prices of some of the, uh, the food prices up and then it came down. So, in fact, it's a little bit of their logic. They focus on something specific, and they see these things like, you know, the broccoli is uh, about $10. It needs to come down because nobody will be able to buy it anymore. And so, and you see a lot of these price reversal 
in, in the actual CPI data itself. So in that sense, it's not completely a fantasy. It's just because of, of what they're really focusing as opposed to the overall CPI. Just my comment. Okay, very, very good. So indeed, that, that was, uh, I think, uh, uh, a very useful set of comments. Um, so let me just again uh, see, again, I think, uh, uh, given the expertise of this audience, uh, comments or questions, uh, e either is uh, w welcome. So please. Hi, um, Tarun Ramadurai, Imperial. Um, I was really intrigued by the correlation between the local inflation expectations of firms and the uh, EC, I mean the euro area inflation expectations. And I wondered about two things. One is a, a sort of empirical question and the other one is a more conceptual question. The empirical question is, is that different for firms that are multinational firms or firms that are closer, closer to national borders where they can actually source inputs from across the border? Um, and then the more conceptual question is, is there a way to deal with the fact that there are obviously real rigidities that are preventing nominal euro-wide policy from, from sorting out the issue? And does that mean that we need more instruments? That is to say, can you get um, banks in particular local areas to change policies in particular ways and use prudential regulation as an aid to inflation setting policy? OK, th th thank you, Turin. So Yuri? <clears throat> The, the empirical question is great. Uh, we're working on revising this paper. This is a terrific idea. We should incorporate it and see if the responses are going to be different for multinationals or firms close to borders. Um, it's a terrific question. Um, I would say, you know, what we find there about local conditions shaping aggregate expectations, it's not unusual. It's consistent with other evidence we have uh, for households, for firms. Um, but you know, for me, it was striking that you can see this so clearly. Even when you aggregate this data to country levels, you you would think that at some level this this should not be easy to see in the data. But it is very clear. Um, in terms of you know what we should do uh, with this as policymakers, maybe it's it's not. Uh <laughs> no, no. Uh, so I think the second question, which is, is there a role for local policy? Uh, I think is is very interesting, and maybe just I'll flag. First of all, empirically. There was a, a lot of national policies in late 2022. Uh, some level is just simply protect people from the surge in the cost of living. But in other cases, it was also maybe, can we moderate inflation expectations and therefore the size of the second round effect um, by, by you know, curtailing the peak inflation rate? Uh, and so at our Cintra Forum last year, I think, uh, Pierre-Olivier Gurnchas and a team from the IMF went through the uh, uh, you know, effectiveness of those local policies, which in some cases were energy subsidies, uh, other cases there were other interventions. So, to, I mean, I, I think uh, for prices, it's, you know, subsidies, controls, uh, all of these things have been rolled out. Uh, your wider question about the role of local banking systems and so on, uh, this is not, I think, specific to, to the inflation issue. But in general, we, we do have a lot of national macroprudential policy now. So when we think about the impact of financial transmission, the fact there is variation across countries in, in uh, macro pru does matter. It probably matters more during phases of credit expansion than periods when, when credit is pretty quiet, as it has been in the EU area recently. So good. So please. I'm Philippine Korsiman at the uh, European Central Bank. Um, it's uh, really great to have uh, the, um, uh, the findings which are quite similar on the various expectation surveys from households, firms, the markets, and the professional forecasters across the, the three uh, central banks here. And when, uh, one element is indeed that the, mar the professional forecasters would have their expectations below the households, the firms. So part of it is indeed because of what is being uh, purchased and the attention focused on the groceries and so on that was discussed. But I would say another part may, can be um, the fact that the professional forecasters or the market participants will look at an 
index that will tell the expectations of a statistical index which all its construction. So the ones that we would use at central banks. Whereas the households, the firms, they would look at the households, the cost of living, and the firms, um, what they can uh, sell at which price. And we know there is some statistical adjustments, some representativeness issues, and, and for instance, just to speak about the quality adjustment, I think it was when inflation was at around 2%, two, two something like a quarter of it was because of a quality adjustment in the statistics of 0.5%. So how much of that do you think, uh, of these different um, focuses on indices or cost of living and selling prices would explain the differences we've seen over time in the expectations? So, so uh, let me expand your question for the rest of the panel because on top of all that you said, uh, we also uh, uh, in the area have a CPI versus HICP. Of course, you also have PCE issues and so on. Uh, so uh, I, mean, I think you raise an interesting question there. So again, um, and partly I'll, I'll link it uh, to, to what I said about survey design. Because of course, the question you ask, you have to know what, what is the question you're asking, uh, ex exactly what it is. <coughs> so, so Wilbert, maybe? Yeah, no, I think even across, you know, formal statistics like the CPI and the PCE, they give, you know, there, there often is a gap. And so, yeah, how do quality adjustments feed in? And um, so our approach was to, you know, we, we explored early on in the you know, uh, creation of the survey, we did a lot of testing of our question wording. And uh, most people had no idea what a PC or CPI was, um, but they, ha they were quite willing to talk about inflation. They kind of could define it, they understood it. Uh, some people were thinking more about maybe had in mind a fixed consumption basket and thought about how that would change, you know, the prices of that basket would change and not taking into account substitution and so on. And you get, a, you know, there's some differences across people, but we kind of let them define it and that's what we're tracking. And we do find even in, you know, they, even when you ask for their perceptions of past inflation, there's always this gap. So people seem to kind of uh, overweight certain types of items, you know, more salient, you know, changes in prices, gas prices, food often have a slightly higher weight. Um, and, you know, but we, for our perspective, it's, uh, w whatever they use, if they act on those beliefs, if this is what they think inflation is, and this is what they act on, then that's what we want to measure. Whether it maps directly to the CPI or PCE, in some sense, does it matter? Because we want to measure what drives their decision, what affects their decisions. So their concept of inflation is, the, is what we use. So, Kim, I don't know if you have... Yes, so, uh, maybe I'll give an example. So when uh, the pandemic happened, one of the things we did, uh, worked with Patrick on this, was to update the, uh, a measurement of the uh, expenditure basket that uh, consumers had. Because remember, when we do the CPI, we have to have a survey of household spending. And the, from that, you get the expenditure weights. So that had been updated. So one of the things we did was we uh, got data from some payment card networks and getting uh, some broad categories, some categories of the expenditures, we were able to recompute the expenditure weights. And then once we worked with Statistics Canada, we were able to create an adjusted, CP, adjusted CPI. It was um, considered a very experimental project. But one of the things we saw was that uh, even though at, at some points of the pandemic, we were showing negative uh, or deflation. Actually, using this adjusted CPI, we actually showed it was it was still inflation. It was positive. So it just goes back to all this measurement issues and the basket that one faces. When we if we start thinking about this, uh, some type of despairs or pash, you know, we use a, some type of ideal index, Rolling Fisher. 
that requires quite a bit of uh, machinery behind it. Mm -hmm. And so that's quite uh, expensive in terms of financial costs to do run the surveys, but also the resource costs to do this. So that's why, in some cases, we, when we do this, that's why we are relying on multiple sources of information to see where we have gaps. And that's what it goes back to this explainability. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, that Statistics Canada did uh, very laudably, they created a, um, an online app so you could go there and then you input some key characteristics about yourself, what type of basket, and then you would compute it and say your inflation rate would be this. So I think that's, that's a very interesting thing to do. And that's what we talk about, what you experience what you, and your expectations. I, w I will very briefly say I want to echo what uh, Wilbert said about the, the importance of framing questions correctly. Yesterday, Anna Maria gave a keynote uh, lecture about um, low scores on financial literacy. People confuse lots and lots of you know numbers, and uh, for many people, it's a challenge to understand what is inflation, compounding. It's for some people, it's easier to talk about the general level of prices, and this may include house prices, stock market prices many prices which are definitely not in the CPI. Um, and, and so, you know, there is a certain distance between uh, what policy makers are talking about and what people have in their minds. Uh, but the key thing is that if people think this is the relevant statistic for them, if they act on these perceptions and expectations, this is what we should take into account when we think about optimal policy responses. So, so maybe the only extra thing, thing I'll say is at one level, you might hope that some of what you said there is like a level effect. Mm. But actually, it, it's, it's not obvious that it's only a level effect. Because if in a large shock episode, these different measures move in a different way, then, then the, what I was emphasizing in terms of the, the term structure and the dynamic may also uh, be affected by what, you know, uh, under normal circumstances might indeed just be, be level differences across measures. Um, so please, yeah. okay. Thanks very much. Uh, Ivan Yatsov, Bank of England. I wanted to follow up on one of the last points from your talk, Wilbert, about the challenge of maintaining response rates, especially over time and as you're contacting the same people over and over. Are there any strategies that you or any of the other panel members have found particularly effective to address that? Yeah, so I, I think the problem with response rates is uh, is primarily it's harder and harder to get certain subpopulations like younger respondents and lower income respondents. So we have adjusted to that to do more um, oversampling uh, of those populations, uh, you know, given that they have a lower response rate. Um, there are there's evidence that um, you know different incentives can matter, but you have to be careful there in terms of ethics concern that you don't pay as that much that it becomes like coercive almost to uh, get people to respond to surveys. But even paying people in different, like instead of cash, paying for example higher income people at the very high end, also very hard to get response, you know, a good response rate, but. It turns out that higher income people are more sensitive to things like uh, miles, uh, mm. miles points and things like that. So, so th I, and there's a lot of experimentation going on um, using mixed interview modes. Uh, for example, when you do a mail-in survey, uh, one of the problems is people don't open the envelope. You know, they just get, uh, <laughs> so one way to address that, and, and I've seen an experiment, a randomized experiment on that, is to have a, a window where you, you see the $5 bill. <laughs> <laughs> they actually tried this. It didn't increase the response rates, which I was kind of shocked by. But, but there's a lot of experimentation like that. And, um, you know, there's now digital recruitment. It's becoming a lot of companies are getting into that. Um, the problem there is that usually the, these are people who are shopping for something. So it might be useful for many different kinds of surveys to sample from people who are shopping. Uh, but if you want to measure 
spending intentions or expectations, it might not be the right sample to, to get. But so I, I would just say it is, it's, it's harder and harder to do this. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it and just we increase our efforts to do it, to do it right. And, and luckily there's a, you know, a lot of initiatives going on. And another one, I think that because the cost factor is important too, but I've seen new ways of interviewing people using robots mm. uh, that are actually quite amazing. Uh, I was very impressed. Uh, they were very lifelike, very personable. But most impressive was that when you did the, they asked you the question and you couldn't quite understand what they were getting at, you could ask questions to the robot and it asked, answered back just as well as a person would have. Now that could really save a huge amount of money. Uh, so I would just say there's just a lot of, you know, new thinking going on and uh, so I'm optimistic, but it's, <laughs> it's still a challenge. So, so was the robot Optimus Prime or? <laughs> <laughs> Very well trained. Yeah. <laughs> so Kim, I don't know if you want to add anything on this, this point. Yeah, so I, we, we all face this. And one of the things that some of our surveys, especially on the merchant and consumer service on payments, we've always engaged the uh, public duty and letting people know that when they answer the survey, it's going to be used for policy making. So um, with the, the Stillman method, we got the governor of the Bank of Canada to actually give an advance letter to say, you will be receiving this. and your responses are very important to us. So it creates that Nielsen effect. So uh, that part, uh, there are some of these experiments and differential incentives. I think the, uh, the one thing that we've always tried to do is um, work very closely with our panel provider to really look at high quality uh, panelists. So one thing we did was we did a, it was very costly, but we did an entire refresh sometimes just to go through the entire list and say who's done what, how often they have, they've done the surveys, uh, and then use this uh, metric of what we call, uh, some people could be bad actors. <laughs> They're just coming in there to get the incentive, doing straight lining or doing s adding noise. So there's uh, methods to remove those f people from the sample. So rather than focusing on just brute force, making sure everybody in that thing is engaged and willing to do the survey at a high quality. Because you raised it earlier on with the market participant survey, I don't know if you've any comments on whether the market participant survey, they're all all in fully professional or do you see anything that you need to do to keep them on track? Well, I, I always think that from what I've read and have discussions with people doing the market participants survey, we try to get at all these market participants. And it's very clear that um, they say every time you are talking to the staff and not the uh, right. executive council members so that your, your responses are very useful for research. So. Good. Uh, Yuri, because I presume you've had the experience with both academic surveys versus having the stamp of approval of the government yeah or, or uh, uh, other four parts of the state such as central banks uh, yeah so will you tell me I mean did, um, I think you know one thing which is very clear in the recruitment of people willing to participate in the service is that you have to have credibility and trust of those people and um, from my personal experience, if I tell potential subjects that I'm a Berkeley professor and would you please participate in this survey, it, it, it helps a little bit, but the seal of approval from the government is much more powerful. The downside of that, however, is that if subjects know that this is a survey run by the ACB, Bank of Canada, or the New York Fed, they may get, you know, they may get, uh, you know, behavior in a slightly different manner and this is not what we want. Uh, but from my personal experience, if uh, requests come from credible institutions, and usually this is the government, uh, their response rates tend to be much, much higher. Very good. So let me come back to the, to the audience. 
this. Georgiakos ECB, uh, probably I shouldn't have asked this question, or, or maybe I'm a bit biased from my recent research, but I want to ask more about uh, inflation uncertainty. Especially, Wilbert, I saw that uh, you measure uncertainty over longer term horizons. And of course, I understand this is very important also to incorporate in uh, showing this term structure of uh, inflation expectations. But I saw that for the longer term horizon, basically you, you saw you find less uncertainty vis-a-vis -vis the three year and vis-a-vis -vis the one year. I was wondering, do we feel confident enough that we, with these measures of eliciting uncertainty, they are also consistent across horizon? Definitely they are consistent. So for a given horizon, uh, totally, uh, I see they are uh, consistent. But how do you think about this thing that uh, when you ask people about longer horizons, uh, they, they seem at least, uh, according to the results you have, mm -hmm. to to be less uncertain. And in the end of the day, when we use also this term structure, shall we also somehow report or standardize for a kind of increasing uncertainty? Yeah, I think this is a, you know, definitely a very good area for further research. Like really what, what do the, what are the implications of a changing, you know, shape of a distribution uh, for the term structure? And it, yeah, so th on the three-year horizon, we see you know somewhat lower uncertainty, and, and that would be consistent with still being a lot of you know uncertainty about the timing of the declines in inflation, how quickly do we go back to target? Uh, so uh, definitely, there I think there's a lot of information in there, but yeah, we haven't really done a lot of work with that, but uh, yeah, it's, I think it's very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, just to pick up on that point, uh, Patrick Sabourin from Bank of Canada. Okay. So that's a point that I had, like um, for longer term expectations, we have two years at the Bank of Canada and five years. And the longer you go, um, I feel the the more important, the words you're using to phrase the, the questions is important. For instance, we had uh, initial questions, where do you think inflation will be five years down the road? And we feel that, you know, the point they're looking at, I don't know if it's distant past, we don't know where it is, but it seems to they match the, the level in five years to probably the last point they remember inflation could be. And so it's more a kind to a cumulative growth in price or, you know, where the level would be versus now. But if you ask the questions, okay, think about inflation from the fourth years, like the Mm -hmm. uh, 48 months to the 60th month, where do you think inflation would be? And we, we kept these two uh, questions. Uh, and then you compile uh, both expectations and uncertainty, you get completely different uh, answer. Uh, if you put more anchor, uh, that looks more like a year-over-year -year measurement, you see th those expectations coming down, but you have a completely different signals. Uh, you see... Uh, <laughs> In one point, you see higher uncertainty, and the other side, you see declining uncertainty. So in terms of uncertainty, it seems to be dramatically dependent on the way you phrase question. So, so maybe, Yuri, because um, you raised this, this issue about disagreement. And disagreement, of course, is a conceptually a distinct, but not orthogonal to uncertainty. So um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll convert your, your question to an issue about disagreement at different horizons? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so we know that when you increase the horizon in principle, you can create more disagreement just because people have different views of the world, they have different mental models and, and so on. Uh, but from the qualitative uh, surveys of uh, you know, various subjects, we know the more you increase the horizon, the more they admit that this is guesswork. Right. I, know, I don't really know what the number is, but you know, this is my best guess. Uh, often people refuse to provide responses at longer horizons. They just say, I don't know. Um, and so uh, you know, I will be more careful in terms of you know, what we can learn from long-term um, projections, especially for households, maybe for professional forecasters, it's a safe you know, object for analysis. But for households and firms, 
it's very clear that one year ahead inflation expectations, they have a clear idea what is going to happen. But at longer horizons, especially five years and above, um, this is where they start to really guess what inflation is going to be. Sure. Okay, so, um, Georgia? Yeah, George Otop and New York Fed. Um, so just to follow up on a couple of points that have come up, I think the term structure of uh, uncertainty, I agree, is very important. And it also can tell us something about the, um, uh, the respondents' understanding of what is the underlying process for inflation. So, you know, you can think of the two extremes. If they think that inflation is a random walk versus an IID process, you're going to have very different profiles for uh, the term structure of uncertainty and so we can learn something about the underlying process of inflation that respondents have in mind um, and that has implications for anchoring and so on. Um, and then just to echo what uh, Patrick and, and Yuri were just saying, I think you know we have found that it's very important uh, when you ask about longer term expectations that you are very precise about what period you're, <laughs> you're uh, talking about and and so you know we have converged to this wording like the Bank of Canada where we ask about calendar dates and you know we were talking with Yuri about that yesterday um, so you know if, if we're asking today we would ask about you know inflation between whatever October of 2029 and October of 2030 um, sorry 28 and 29 there you go um, <laughs> Whereas, you know, other surveys might use a, a wording that's a little, that can be confusing. So if you ask about, you know, inflation over the next five to ten years, you know, that can be open to different interpretations. And so it can lead to disagreement, but it's not real disagreement. It's only about the different interpretations of the question. So, Yuri. You know, one comment I want to make here is that we often have a, a debate about which inflation expectations we should use for understanding economic behavior and for policy. And uh, my reading of the data is that for most people, one year ahead um, for a casting horizon, this is probably the max. You know, most people have much shorter horizons. And uh, one piece of research I would like to see going forward is when we ask people hypothetical questions, you know, what would happen with your consumption, with your search, job search intensity, if we do something today, if we do something in 12 months, in three years, in five years, and so this will have a firm understanding of what is the horizon for them. And maybe we shouldn't then ask them, you know, five year or 10 year ahead inflation expectations because it doesn't affect anything for them. Very good. So um, if you have a question, uh, time is, is uh, running out. So, so you pl please uh, don't, don't be shy. Um, so. All clear. Uh, well, OK, so, so, uh, so I think the inference is all questions have been settled, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, which gives a good feeling, and we we can go back to the kind of more pure research w <laughs> without worrying about the po the policy consequences. Uh, so, w with that, um, let me before closing, just in case there's anything uh, you meant to say but you forgot to say, or uh, any other uh, responses from the panel members. Good. Okay, very good. So. Uh, let me thank the panelists for, for a very interesting uh, uh, session and for their contributions and, and for very good comments and, and questions uh, f from the floor. And uh, with that, uh, people can uh, proceed uh, to lunch, so thank you. <laughs>